said the last day of the season of Easter for the next several months, all of them until the, the beginning of Advent, we'll be celebrating the season after Pentecost. But today is Pentecost. It is, as Holly said, the birthday of the church. It is the day when we celebrate the coming of the Holy Spirit. Being in the season of Advent, you've got to expect some pretty amazing things are going to happen, huh? I mean, it was amazing enough that Jesus rose from the dead on Easter, but if this is Easter, then what more might you expect? Well, as the words of a much overused, I admit, popular song say, don't believe, just watch. Just watch. People were gathered from all over the Jewish faith, all over the empire in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost. They were gathered for the giving of the Holy Spirit, though, because they didn't know what was coming. They were gathered for the Jewish festival of Pentecost 50 days after, not Easter, but Passover. 50 days after Passover to celebrate the giving of the law, the giving of God's commands on Mount Hor, or Mount Sinai, rather, after the Israelites had been delivered from captivity in Egypt. Most of the celebrations of the Christian church have their roots in something other than Christianity, Easter, Christmas. And, the, and, and, and this was no other. Most of our festivals have, have a more earthly uh, origin. This is a picture not of the original Pentecost, as you may, might have thought, but a gathering of 5,000 redheads in the Netherlands in 2013. I thought it was appropriate to have a gathering of redheads on the Sunday when we talk about the apostles having flames on their heads. This was, for the Jews, a, a celebration, but it was a fairly ordinary Celebration. Now I see a redhead back there. And a lot of our celebrations can become ordinary over time. We gather together, we sing some songs, we pray some prayers, we worship together, we visit together, but we don't necessarily expect a whole lot to happen. And then when the Holy Spirit is involved, you just never know. In Martin Luther's explanation of the part of the Apostles' Creed that talks about the Spirit, he says the Holy Spirit calls and gathers and enlightens and sanctifies and keeps us in Jesus' name. It is the Spirit that calls us together in the first place. And when the Spirit is present, you know we know what might happen. <coughs> Take baptism. Don't believe me? Just wash. We gather together in baptism, and especially if we have a lot of them, like we had this past year or two. Baptism, too, even though it's so important to us as Christians, especially Lutheran Christians, it can become commonplace. So we pour some water in a bowl. We light a candle. We don't really expect a whole lot's going to happen. The most extraordinary thing that might happen is that the Bible, the baby rather, stays silent during the whole thing. But where the Holy Spirit is present, you just never know. told me the best way to blow out a fire is not to blow it out, to extinguish it with your breath, because you never quite know where the breath is going to send it. 
but simply to gradually remove the breath, remove the oxygen. That was rubbing alcohol, not water, in case you didn't figure that out. But you have to be careful with the fire of the Holy Spirit. A little breath can indeed cause it to catch fire. So I told this story before. Some of you probably have not heard it. A well-known writer and teacher by the name of William Willimon was the dean of the chapel at Duke University. When he received a call from an angry father of one of his students, the father said, how dare you? You wrecked my child's whole life. What are you talking about? He says. Four years she studied pre-med. She is accepted into medical school. She could have gone on to a wonderful career in medicine. And now she's going to South America to engage in mission. So? You wrecked her life, and I blame you for turning her in this direction. The woman said, let me understand something. Did you have her baptized? Yeah, the father said. Did you take her to Sunday school where she could learn God's word? Yeah, her mother and I did. Did you see her through confirmation so that she could understand God's work in the world? Yeah. So, well then said, then you, sir, are the one who is to blame. When you raise children in the Spirit, when you invite the Holy Spirit into their lives in baptism, you just never know what's going to happen. A little spark can cause a field to go up in flames. What might be attempted as a controlled burn can light a forest on fire. But we do like to try to control the spirit, don't we? Control it within our rituals. Control it within our walls. Control it within our theologies. Control it any way we can. Just so it doesn't get away. But our meager attempts to try to control the Holy Spirit are as fruitless as a man standing out trying to put out a forest fire with a garden hose. No matter how big a swimming pool he may have as a reservoir, it's not going to do much good. <coughs> so what happened when the Holy Spirit lit upon those disciples? They began to preach. They began to speak. In all different languages, actually, the scholars aren't exactly sure whether the Bible means they spoke in all different languages, as we say spoke in tongues, or whether they were understood in all different languages. Whichever the case, 3,000 or more people heard the word of God and were amazed. Because aren't these men all Galileans? How is it that each one of us hears them in his own, own, own native language to which a predecessor of Martin Luther must have said, what does this mean? Now, some words don't take a whole lot of interpretation. Some take a little bit more. But all this took place to back 
back up what Jesus said. Go into all the world and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Invite the Holy Spirit into their lives that there might be a holy flame throughout the world. And that the Word of God might be breathed throughout the nation. As I said, some words take less translation than others. I'm guessing you could probably guess what one young man is saying to the other, even though it's in Spanish. Huh? Ha estado cautivando durante mucho tiempo? Anybody here know what that means? I bet almost anybody, somebody tell me what that means. If you know the picture, you know what it means. Have you been farming long? Some words take a little bit more interpretation and might be a little more important to know. Don Esta El Baño? Where's the bathroom? Some might be even more important. Where's the bread? Where can I find food? Someone has said, evangelism is merely one beggar telling the other beggar where to find food, where to find bread. And we know, don't we? We come to Jesus to find the bread. We come to Jesus who is the bread of life. And we are invited to invite others to taste and see that the Lord is good to invite the bread of life into our lives and into the lives of others. That invitation could be as simple as saying, Jesus loves me, Jesus me ama. It could be as simple as saying, I love you, te amo. It could be as simple as taking another's hand and saying, the peace of Christ be with you. La paz de Cristo. However you do it, it is Christ's wish that we share the good news with one another in the power of the Holy Spirit that gives us not only the impulse, the ability, but the language with which to share that word. So then, whether in Hebrew, the language of Israel, or Arabic, the language of the majority of Muslim countries, we can say with Christ, go in peace and pray for God's peace in our midst.